share my um, uh, thoughts and research finding on this topic. As uh, I mentioned, that I, I research on a number of things, and the China Award Investment uh, is uh, one of the things that I have been working on recently, and um, and uh, so including trying investment into developing countries, the so-called global south, and also. I'm recently just involved in a uh, uh, research networks uh, funded by the European Union about uh, it's the European Union that's Office of Science and Technolo Technology about Chinese investment in Europe. Um, so there's a lot of Huawei and all this kind of stuff going on. Um, look at that. So this um, China and global capitalism thing is uh, is my constant interest since my last book. And uh, this Bear and Road, of course, that everybody can talk about Bear and Road then. And um, they they keep expanding the definition of Baron Road. Recently, I checked that they allow us the starting to include not only Central Asia, South Asia, and and uh, uh, and, um, and Southeast Asia, and and, um, and into the Baron Road, and then they start to include uh, like Latin America. Like right? in some official documents, they start talking about Latin Chinese investment in Latin America as part of Baron Road. So it's really basically uh, in Africa, that. And 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 uh, Chinese investment in all kind of uh, the developing countries are now folded under the umbrella of Bell and Row. When you go to a bookstore in in China, then you will find that there's a lot of publications under the umbrella of Bell and Row. Even my friend who study music, uh, you see a lot of like Bell and Row music, Bell and Row, yeah, all this kind of stuff. So it seems that whatever thing you're doing, you put a bell and roll uh, label on that, it sells and you get research for ground and things like that. And then um, in, just in August, I went to Asia Studies uh, conference uh, in Leiden, that's like, um, it's a huge conference, but there, there are nearly a hundred panels about bell and roll, with scholars from China, from Europe, from all around the world. So everybody's talking about it, but at the same time, I need to be um, um, kind of um, cautious when there's a kind of, I, I, I have uh, graduate students working on Chinese investment in Philippines and Chinese investments in uh, Southeast Asia and and I, I always warn them don't be don't too enthusiastic about this Baron Road uh, label um, because this kind of thing can come to by the time you finish your dissertation that depending on how fast or how slow you, you, you are in the dissertation writing that it might be already not in fashion and, and and so I'm going to talk about not only the economic origins and why it come about uh, the Baron Road project, but also the, the limits of the Baron Road and the challenge of the Baron Road and the Chinese government uh, attempt to uh, solve these problems. If this problem is solved, then the Baron Road can continue to expand. But if not, then it is going to be not um, expanding as fast as uh, many people expect. First, actually, that uh, I have a lot of a number of works that um, come out from this project. And, and first is an article in the book chapter. This forthcoming is in, in production. It's China and the Global South. It's, there's no Baron Row in the title, but it's basically covering a lot of things about Baron Row, and it is uh, actually my presentation today. It's going to be based on. Uh, so it is a forthcoming book, um, and then I also uh, added a special section for uh, open source journal paragraph communications uh, on China and the Global South. That uh, it is the list of the paper in this special section. You can check it out. It's open. Um, uh, for download, uh, so I have the introduction, um, and um, there's an article about the Philippines, uh, Chinese investment in the Philippines, there's about Chinese investment in uh, Argentina, um, uh, soybean industries or agriculture, and there's an the article by the Maham Hamid, uh, Hamid is a, is, a, is a think tank researcher from Lahore, I talk about his China Pakistan economic corridor, uh, and also China in uh, Central Asia, this will be one more, yeah. And also two on China in Central Asia. Uh, so check it out and um, um, if you are interested. And today, my, my, I usually like outline uh, my main argument before I go into the details because uh, I have the like, uh, tendency to talk forever and, and, and the host will usually cut me short so I won't be able to go to the conclusion. Just uh, prepare for that, so I uh, tell the conclusion before, before um, <laughs> and, uh, I, I go to the talk. First, I uh, um, um, talk about the fact that the, the urge for China to export capital, that is foreign direct investment from China, not into China, uh, is driven by the, some problem in China's domestic political economy. Uh, the second part may be the most boring part, so I will uh, uh, do it fast, but get in the detail if you have uh, uh, interest in it in the Q&A, that is, uh, 
I do a lot of calculation about this scale of China's uh, capital export or foreign direct investment, and what I find is that there is a kind of exaggeration, vast exaggeration in many new paper report, and even many the United States uh, think tank uh, report about the scale and the size of this Chinese investment. It's vastly exaggerated, and I find that actually there's about one to ten ratio. That uh, like uh, uh, if the estimation of ten million, then usually what actually actualizes is uh, usually one million. So the ratio is quite consistent. I'll tell you why I how I come up with this number. Uh, and then the challenge of the sparing world, and that is uh, basically the security and political risks of the sparing world is underestimated. Uh, and trying to, of course, it's not that the Chinese government underestimated. The Chinese government know it that it's a big security and political risk, and they need to solve it. Without solving these political and security issues and problems, uh, the sparing world uh, initiative cannot go on uh, and to expand uh, as much as people expect. Uh, so it is a key thing that people need to pay attention to. Um, it's also like in the old Silk Road that uh, in, in the beginning of the slide I have this kind of a map of Silk Road that you look at the ups and downs of Silk Road over 1,000, 2,000 years you see that there's a moment when this Silk Road uh, trade network is integrated and sometimes uh, it became prosperous and usually the prosperous time is the time when the central Eurasian space was uh, uh, politically safe uh, and the prime examples uh, during the case of Mongolia that, that there's one vast empire covering the whole place so trader can move from east to west easily without much um, uh, trouble um, getting into uh, bandits or warlords or anything because there's one empire covering the whole space in many other times when the, the, the whole political phase is fragmented there uh, conflict going on and nobody uh, is hegemonic then usually the trade uh, route didn't work and then it, it, it is integrated. So this kind of political question, uh, security question, uh, is very important in the old times as in the in, in current times. Um, so the, and at the very end I will look at uh, uh, Chinese government's uh, current uh, tentative solution to this security and political risk uh, problem uh, in the very and Road project. Uh, first, uh, China's domestic political economy, and uh, I've written about it in this book, um, uh, published in 2015, the China Boomerang, China Rural Rural, um, that uh, I start to talk about the China investment in the global south and developing country, and, and I uh, tend to be a late sayer uh, to point out the problem rather than celebrate uh, all these kind of state finance projects in China's government, and then many of my left-wing friends in the U.S. is very upset because of the title. By the way, that my editor is responsible by for subtitle, not myself. <laughs> I have a more bookish and nerdish subtitle, like Origin, Crisis, and Global Impact, something like that. Then, and, and the editor that Noble Gold is going to buy the book with this subtitle. <laughs> and put this subtitle in there, that uh, make my many left wing and China loving friends uh, very upset. They, they think that, oh, you are wrong, the China is definitely going to rule the world. And then, less than a year, that the China uh, published this uh, simplified character version of the book. I don't know about it. They just published it and, and, and sent me a copy. And then they make the subtitle, the title of the Chinese version. So, so, so they are more enthusiastic to 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 tell people and tell the people that actually China is not going to rule the world. That uh, as as uh, the foreign minister of China, Wang Yi, that. Uh, well, we did this yesterday in the uh, United Nations, just telling everybody, don't don't feel that China is so friendly. We are just a poor developing country. We are still a poor developing country. <laughs> we are not going to pay the power game in the world and things like that. And uh, uh, so 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 don't see us as a threat. So there's a substantial people in in, in China among official and intellectuals. Uh, 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 so a circle who is very uh, feeling uneasy uh, about this kind of uh, talk about China is going to rule the world. So they, they actually try to uh, point out the problem rather than uh, uh, the, uh, the celebration of uh, China uh, uh, going to rule the world. And there's a lot of things that I can go on forever, but I have to cut off. For example, they change the translation. Uh, some words and some phrase, and think that's what they do when they translate English book into Chinese book. But uh, to my surprise, that uh, there's some criticism of Xi Jinping uh, urbanization policy. They didn't turn it off; they keep it there. Mm -hmm. But there's some unexpected phrase that they change. For example, whenever I mention capitalism in China or Chinese capitalism in the Chinese version, they all change it to market socialism with Chinese characteristics. <laughs> so it's, it is it's politically okay to criticize Xi Jinping's some specific policy, but it is not okay to say that there's capitalism in China. 
Yeah, yeah. 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 careful. It's like Chinese. Uh, it is uh, market socialism, Chinese characteristics. But it is not 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 just. Politically, political correctness, BS, and, and I think deeper than, than actually there's some substantive um, uh, meaning to why they're so obsessed with not recognizing it is capitalism in China. There's some, some importance in there. And I actually I'm trying to work uh, on a short article to, to talk about this, uh, but it is not covered in, in, in the scope of today's uh, topic. So the Chinese domestic political economy, to put it short, is that to, and, uh, everybody now knows that uh, there's a drastic slowdown in China's economy, um, and of course it's in the range of 6.5%, uh, and recently there is uh, financial uh, uh, firms, uh, researchers, that actually don't trust the Chinese GDP data, they use big data, they use satellite image to uh, to uh, try to get a more accurate gauge of uh, uh, economic growth, and they come up with a number like in the range of 2-3% uh, growth, much lower than uh, the Chinese growth. Uh, official growth figures, but everybody now knows that that is a slowdown. And this figure um, is the China Manufacturing uh, Purchasing Manager Index. Uh, that is uh, the thing that many many uh, economies and also uh, some uh, financial investors will use to gauge the Chinese economy because uh, it's a lead indicator that uh, I don't want to explain in detail, but manufacturing PMI is basically uh, to gauge whether the manufacturing sector, and they have a service PMI as well, I will show you in a minute. Uh, whether it's expanding or contracting, uh, the line of, um, of 50 is the, is, the, is the dividing line of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, expansion. The 50 is around here. This is, uh, uh, above 50 is expanding, below 50 is contracting. So you see that uh, before 2008, financial crisis has been expanding uh, quite vigorously. Um, uh, so there are two two data. Uh, it is why people like to use the data because there are two, there's a private source of the data and a public source of the data. That uh, The Chinese uh, Bureau of National Statistics uh, published this data. This is the official PMI and then HSBC. First is HSBC and then Chai Xin, this is a financial magazine uh, in, in China, uh, is doing this uh, uh, data. So you can cross track the two set of data. To, to, so it is reliable when you cross track the two, though they have different emphasis. The official data uh, the data collection point is focused on uh, is, is more concentrated in large sale enterprise, while the HSBC and Chai Xing data focus on private smaller uh, business. Uh, but it, both of them in line. So, so there's some discrepancy once in a while, but uh, they're mostly in line. So before 2008, you see there's a big expansion, and then 2008 global financial crisis is a big drop, and then it comes back up very rapidly. It is the famous uh, the stimulus, um, the 2009 2010. Uh, stimulus, uh, uh, financial monetary stimulus uh, that put forward by the Chinese government. So there's a healthy expansion again, but actually in the end it is not that so healthy because it's not sustainable uh, and it went back down very fast. And, and then uh, ever since uh, the faltering or fading out of this stimulus, you see that uh, expansion um, is not so vigorous, it's quite weak, and actually it's hovering around the 59. There's a contraction, expansion, contraction, expansion. And the purple line is the kind of a um, is a measure of the loan creation uh, by state banks uh, mostly. Um, so it is the, the source of the rebounds that uh, the, the largest part of the st uh, stimulus uh, in 2009, 2010, as a response to the global financial crisis, is a lot of fiscal stimulus that the government didn't increase spending, but the government just tell the state bank to open the front gate of loan. To lend money to local government and, and, and uh, 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 companies to build stuff and to build roads, and build subway, new subway lines. High speed rail is the most uh, uh, well known one. And steel mill to build, build the steel factory, to make steel, uh, all kind of things. And expand your airport. Uh, no, uh, you don't need to care about whether you have customers, just expand it. Uh, just build the stuff. So they open the front gate of um, landing. Uh, so it successfully created a rebound. But you look at the trend afterward that there is a diminishing uh, effect of, uh, of, of loan. Uh, it's a monthly newly created loan in Roman B. That, uh, so uh, when the economy goes back down a little bit, so they open the front gate again of loan. Uh, but you see that every time uh, the, loan, uh, the, the amount of the loan increase has been bigger than the last time, but the effect of stimulus actually gets uh, lower and lower. Um, and uh, my financial uh, 
uh, uh, financially very safe here. Um, uh, uh, academic friend Victor Shi, uh, who, to, who is a political scientist and also uh, used to uh, get the low paid leave uh, from the university to work in a hedge fund and make real money. And, and, and amazingly, after making this big, uh, real money, then, then he came back to academia. And, uh, is, uh, the attraction of academia, that money cannot be. Uh, but but he, he, he has written a lot of amazing stuff and uh, telling us why this kind of diminish, why there's a, this kind of a diminishing um, um, stimulus effect of this loan because uh, re the reason certainly known that uh, uh, local government or local government uh, uh, borrowing vehicles uh, or um, the companies they enterprise they just borrow the money to roll over the whole loan. Uh, because the, the old loan is maturing, so they uh, get fresh uh, loans to uh, repay part of the old loan or pay the interest of the old loan. So the lot, a lot of the money is uh, uh, used and uh, diverted into, uh, into, into real investment that create jobs and create uh, economic activity. So they split like financial rollover of these loans. So that is a problem right now because uh, the, uh, the indebtedness is a problem uh, in the Chinese domestic economy if you follow the news that the Chinese government is very worrying about uh, the uh, accumulation of debt by local government and by corporations they are heavily indebted. Uh, they don't want to want them to be further indebted. But at the same time when the economy really uh, uh, went down further, they scared about they're scared about this employment and, and, and uh, economic prospect, then they reluctantly open the front gate to, uh, to let uh, the state bank uh, land more again. So this this kind of a uh, situation that China is that stuck in right now. And this is manufacturing, and you look at the curve about uh, surface, uh, the gray one uh, is doing a little bit better than manufacturing, but still, um, uh, but still uh, about uh, following the same pattern. So there's kind of a situation. Of course, you see, you, you hear a lot about uh, these uh, Chinese uh, moving to a service economy and look at Alibaba and things like that. But the Alibaba is just like us. That uh, is booming at the expense of uh, this kind of brick and mortar uh, retail store and, 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 and shopping mall. In the US, you know that while Amazon is booming, um, many shopping mall and, and, and traditional retail businesses are closing down. The same actually happening in China when Alibaba is uh, expanding in this e-commerce and and Taobao and all this kind of thing. Then and local uh, shopping mall is in crisis and then this traditional brick and mortar uh, retail store is price crisis. So this kind of a uh, China is shifting, uh, shifting to service economy big time uh, is vastly exaggerated. You look at the service uh, PMI, you know that it is uh, not doing as great as uh, the media would portray. So there's the uh, economic slowdown in. in in the Chinese economy, and uh, and uh, it is the kind of indebtedness in comparatively in comparative perspective that China's uh, outstanding loan as a percentage of GDP, uh, it is not updated. That uh, this is close to 300, like uh, according to many uh, more recent estimates, is already over 300. So it is a big uh, problem. Uh, many people point, uh, point out that actually in uh, in Japan, in South Korea, and many developed countries, that uh, they've got similar level of uh, outstanding debt as a percent of GDP. Uh, so China is going to be fine, but actually, more people also point out that the structure of the loans are different, uh, and also China is a developing country, so uh, 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 it, is, it, it is different uh, situation, and it is tougher for China. And uh, for example, for Japan, that's have a huge loan. <coughs> Uh, debt problem, uh, but uh, a lot of the debt is in the form of government bonds uh, that is held by private citizens uh, who seem seemingly uh, have faith in government, uh, Japanese government bond and keep investing. Uh, regardless, while in, in, in the Chinese case, that a lot of loans are on financial cooperation, uh, that is uh, company loans, and, and if they default, that would be a, uh, the bank will be in trouble and there will be systemic systemic risk. So the loan indebtedness problem in China is, is real and true, and it's why uh, the Chinese government is concerned about it. And then every once in a while, you hear the Chinese leader talk about it. Uh, uh, we need to be careful and, and, and uh, take care of the uh, uh, loan problem. And then this low down indebtedness lead to capital flight and profit seeking uh, capital export. That uh, um, another thing is that this uh, loan uh, is creating the money supply in Roman B. Uh, 
At the same time, the private phone extreme itself has been shrinking since 2015, from 4 trillion to 3 trillion. Uh, it sounds like it's still a big um, uh, amount of 3 trillion for an extreme reserve. But in relation, as a ratio, uh, to uh, the money supply in, in, in China, it is really uh, alarming uh, because uh, uh, when the chronic trade reserve is declining and then you keep creating long and increasing the money supply, then you have a devaluation pressure of your currency. And then people who have the RMB uh, will be very much eager to get the money out to buy apartment uh, houses if they're cool. <laughs> uh, and, and many other places, definitely. And uh, Hong Kong is the first stop in many other places. So there's a huge uh, pressure of capital flight. And also, of course, not all capital outflow is capital flight, but some of them uh, really they want to uh, make profit by investing overseas as, as the economy slows down and indebtedness and is uh, hurting from profitability in the domestic economy. So it is uh, creating huge pressure for capital outflow. And uh, directly connected to the Bell and Road project, you can uh, tell from this. Um, 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 I'm looking at this company reports of this three major machinery, uh, uh, construction machinery manufacturers in China. China that uh, uh, Sunny, Sun, Sunny, so be Zhonglai, so be Zhongnan, and uh, X, XCMG, so be Xuko, Xuko, something like that. And, um, um, and you look at the revenue grow, grow. You see the pattern that uh, in the stimulus. During the uh, stimulus in 2009, 2010, they are doing good, having a good time because uh, all these um, uh, banks are lending money to local government and state enterprise to build stuff. Uh, so they need a lot of uh, this kind of construction machines. So the rapid growth uh, is like it's talking about growth rate. So it's 65 percent, 85 percent of growth. Uh, but after the stimulus uh, uh, fade out, that they got into trouble. That uh, by 2000. 12 and 2013, they got into negative territory. That uh, the revenue group growth is shrinking. Uh, so it is about the same time 2013 when Xi Jinping started to talk about the variable uh, initiative and actually started to, to pump money to uh, all these variable countries, to lend money to these countries to, um, to build stuff. And then most of them uh, buy Chinese uh, machines to build stuff and Chinese still to build stuff. And then their revenue will go back up. And then uh, it's shown in the data, if you actually read the uh, annual report, they are very explicit about uh, thanking Bell and Road. Uh, that how oh, with Bell and Road now our, our, our company is back in the house. They, they, are, they are a public company trading in Hong Kong stock market and, and in other, other, other stock market. So they, uh, you look at their, 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 it's interesting when I do this talk uh, uh, in Hong Kong not long ago and then some students very finance uh, savvy student after he had immediately looked at the cell phone and some of my uh, colleagues there are sitting by the side and they are finding out the students are looking at the stock price of this company. <laughs> uh, and they, they must be doing good uh, because that, and they, they find the very role. Now most of their order is coming from like Kazakhstan, Pakistan, and all these very low countries. So while the domestic order is drying up because they, they're running off stuff to build uh, and local government they cannot and so what they company cannot uh, use it for all that much money, and even if they borrow money, as I said, that they use the roll over to the old loan rather than really to build stuff. So their order in the domestic market is drying up, and then the very roll is a rescue, come to the rescue. So a lot of these kind of companies. So uh, uh, so this very roll initiative, and then it's kind of uh, moving uh, over this kind of uh, uh, initiative. It's not just Xi Jinping himself want to create a pet project and things like that. There's this structural necessity. Uh, that that uh, I, uh, it, it is uh, not very well documented, but I can imagine that uh, my former colleagues in Indiana now are working in the, the Center for Strategic International Studies in DC. Scott Kennedy wrote a book of uh, called uh, Business of Lobbying in China. They talk about the, the document about how these uh, companies and provincial government lobby for policy in the central government. They have their own hotel in Beijing and things like that. So when they have a important meeting in, 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 in Beijing, all of them will stay in the hotel, uh, waiting for the officials. Uh, when they have time, they will lobby for policy for their profits, for their company. So we can imagine this lobbying, industrial lobbying processes at work here. Uh, uh, and most uh, uh, this more years after the uh, uh, fiscal and financial uh, stimulus that this company structuring uh, uh, must be involved in, 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 uh, in influencing uh, and becoming one of the important factors about how and why China have this bad project. 
Another example is steel. Uh, this, this figure is from the US government, so it is uh, misleading in terms of color. color. Because it, it makes Canada uh, look uh, quite bad uh, about importing Chinese steel. But actually, if you look at the color tone, and actually, it's a country that is paying and red actually import a lot of uh, steel, not the blue. I don't know why they, they make it dark with Canada. It seems like Canada is importing a lot of steel, but if you look at the legend there, it's not. Um, uh, so, Basically, the, the red and pink, that uh, many of them are very poor countries, and, and, and uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, and South Korea. And you look at this uh, breakdown of pie chart, you, it, it shows better that the top um, 10 markets for China steel um, uh, 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 more or less very poor country. Uh, Canada is not there. Uh, um, so it is, the spell and will become a kind of a, a kind of big thing to absorb this uh, uh, excess capacity of steel industry in China because one of the key things that the stimulus work, why the stimulus work in back in 2009, 2010 is that they, many local governments uh, just borrow a huge amount of money to build steel. Uh, because of, they don't care about whether the steel will have market, they just build the steel. So when you're building the steel mill, that you stimulate the local economy, create employment and economic activities. But now they have uh, stuck with all these kind of steel that the Chinese domestic economy cannot absorb, and then now it is they're selling it to the very rural countries. Uh, so it's another example about how the very rural actually helped the Chinese economy. And without the very rural, you can imagine the Chinese economy would have been slowing down more drastically. Now it's already quite not good, but uh, but already uh, with the help of Fairmore, it's not as bad as it could have been. Um, and then uh, this scale of uh, China's uh, outward uh, investment. Oh, I'm already out of time, so I have to skip that this part quick. And then, uh, so this is a kind of a, a lot of journalistic report and also think tank uh, trying to um, uh, calculate the scale of China for investment. Uh, in the form of loans and in the form of actual investment. And American Enterprise Institute has a database that's open for download. We can check it out and then they keep updating it. Uh, so they have this China's Global Investment and Tracking Database and then the stock of China's investment in Africa uh, by the end of 2016, which uh, 306 billion US dollar. Um, but if you look at the official data from China, the Ministry of Commerce, uh, they don't have the data every year. But you find a comparable data point, uh, you find that uh, the, um, uh, uh, the above is 306.5 billion just for the Africa part of the data set. So uh, if you look at the Ministry of Commerce data published uh, and showing that by the end of 2015, uh, it's one year apart, but uh, just one year apart, not, shouldn't be that huge different, but the, the number is huge different. That stock of Chinese investment in Africa is actually for it. For, for 34.7 million. And the same thing is that uh, Washington Mary University has an eight, uh, China has an eight data set that to keep track of um, China's uh, global court uh, investment. And eight, uh, four and eight, basically is eight in the forms of loans. Uh, concession loans and grant, but mostly loan. Uh, from 2000 to 2014, they count uh, uh, globally is 354 billion. But again, you look find a comparable data point uh, uh, when uh, the official data from Chinese government is available, you see it's much smaller. It's 24, 27 million, uh, 2003 to 2016. So give and take, so it's not exactly the same data point, but, uh, but it's comparable. So you see this discrepancy. Then you will be puzzled about why this discrepancy. My colleagues at uh, Deborah Brodigan in, in Hopkins also calculated a similar discrepancy, uh, finding that there's a consistent exaggeration of uh, uh, and, and, and she has a field uh, actually with, uh, uh, with eight data. Uh, there's an exchanging fire back and forth in the thing in some uh, 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 um, um, media, uh, public media, that uh, uh, Deborah is uh, saying that the, the data set is uh, some problem, is exaggerated amount, and then they uh, publish articles to defend their measurement and things like that. But I, I, I definitely. Um, uh, on the side uh, that actually I agree that there's a much exaggeration. This is all because of the methodology of this uh, AEI and also the eight data because they compile the aggregate amount of Chinese outward investment by looking doing newspaper cutting. 
they, uh, when there's an announcement uh, uh, in the record of the newspaper that uh, China is going to invest this, uh, that amount in that country, in Africa or in South America, uh, in that year that they put it in the entry, put it in the Excel sheet. So it is a news reporting. Uh, and then the Chinese Ministry of Com Com uh, Commerce and the Ministry of Finance data is an actual disbursement of the money, so actual money spent. So uh, if you have done business in China, you, you, you follow this kind of, you know what it is about. That, uh, so this kind of promise versus delivery. That you have a memorandum of uh, understanding and contract signed, so there's uh, the cutting ribbon, and there's a uh, journalist, there's a uh, cocktail, and then and everyone is happy, so there's a mom being registered. But many of these projects actually didn't happen after the photo ops, and they just patch, uh, but there's nothing happened. It's not that they are deliberately cheating, but as many uh, on the ground research show up that a lot of these are. Agreement and contract didn't work because uh, when they strike the deal, and it's usually for example in Pakistan, and it's the case of Philippines, they strike the deal with the central government. While the project happened in the local government, when they go to the province, and the local government actually they don't know that uh, they don't honor the, the, the deal that the central government done with uh, China. They want to negotiate, and there's all kind of problem on the ground, so that the Chinese government and the company, Chinese company, just give up, and and so nothing happened. So, but this kind of project that didn't happen. Uh, it's not record in in in. Uh, it's recorded as something that actually happened according to the methodology of this uh, database uh, because they only record whatever is being reported. Uh, uh, so they only have this photo of moment uh, being uh, documented and then count the number at the space value without looking at the delivery stage of the project. So it is a rather exaggerated. So I just uh, skip fast forward. Um, and actually, that the bear or even the, by all kind of mind is already shrinking. Uh, the scale of bear in 2017, 2018, I'm sure that is the case in 2019. That has something to do with this uh, shrinking of the Chinese foreign exchange reserve. The, the bear and roll uh, project was uh, conceived in 2012, 2013 at the at the peak of the uh, the Chinese foreign exchange reserve. Uh, so they have a lot of foreign exchange reserve to. Spend, uh, but uh, after 2015, that uh, there's a devaluation of the RMB, and then the Chinese Central Bank did to burn the foreign exchange reserve to stabilize the RMB, um, and there's a, sh uh, a shrinking of the the, the RMB uh, shrinking. Uh, so they are less generous now. That uh, uh, that but we'll see. Uh, so I can skip all of this, um, and uh, that. Uh, we move to the third part of it, that is the security and political risk of China capital export. It is a lot to be underestimated. Uh, for example, it is a report about this kind of a global risk um, um, uh, company that published a report back in 2015 saying that uh, uh, in Africa alone, that there's a lot of kidnapping going on uh, involving uh, Chinese investment there. Personnel is being kidnapped and, uh, and uh, an increase in 262 percent over 2013. Uh, in contrast, only 11 and 17 American nationals are kidnapped in 2014 and 2013. In places like Nigeria, Sudan, South Sudan, and all these places, uh, kidnappers have specifically targeted trying to fix their troubles. Uh, it is not in the news, but uh, the people who are doing serious research and, and because it's a risk, risk management firm. Um, uh, documented it because uh, the, the, until very recently, the Chinese uh, government strategy dealing with of this kidnapping is to pay ransom fast before it gets to the deals. Uh, so, uh, so you solve the problem immediately, but you encourage more people to kidnap uh, Chinese nationals. So it's not very good, um, and that is why it's, uh, it's increasing. And so it's one political and security risk. And another problem is this. Uh, uh, this talk about Chinese imperialism is vastly exaggerated because uh, a lot of problem of China over investment nowadays is exactly why it's exactly because China is not yet an imperialist power. That they spend all the money to these uh, other developing countries, but at the same time, China has low control about the uh, politics of these places. And uh, so there's a lot of problem. For example, this is uh, a half, uh, uh, basically the Chinese company went there, uh, spend a lot of money there, and then uh, and, and the local government actually using Chinese law to build it, and, but they, the Chinese company just left without finishing the project, it's in Venezuela. Um, um, and that, 
So basically, that what happened is that uh, for, uh, during the time of Chabad Chabas, that the Chinese uh, lent a lot of money to Venezuela, and then Venezuela now refusing to repay the loan and saying that we are in a crisis and, and uh, uh, we, are, we are not going to repay. And then the problem is that China has right. the low leverage about it and just, uh, oh yeah, thanks for notifying me. And there's no means that China can push uh, them and force them to repay. And, uh, and another example is this gold, uh, gold processing factory in Kyrgyzstan that uh, has arrived and burned down the Chinese gold processing plant to the ground. And again, that uh, 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 China can just watch it happen. And China has no capability to, 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 to make sure that the local government will really supporting and protecting these this, uh, facilities. And definitely China has no military projection capability to deal with this situation. So it is this kind of a, a lot of this uh, risk. And another thing is that election. As in Malaysia election, uh, China in, the, uh, uh, in Malaysia has a lot of deal with the former government, but they end up election. Uh, change the government and the new government seems to want to negotiate a lot of things and uh, cancel all the projects. So it is uh, the, the challenge that uh, um, China's facing. It's not like the US in, in our investment in the 1950s and 1960s. If we don't repay loans and, and we don't uh, honor the project, that uh, your government will be toppled by some CIA or whatever. I don't know. That I, uh, but, but it's what, how things work. That, uh, then you have the capability to make sure the friendly government is always there and that they will pay the loan and honor the contract, otherwise you will have consequences. But China doesn't have the capability to make sure that. So they're spending all the money and then people are not repaying and, and, and not honoring the contract and things. And, uh, so, uh, and also even kidnapping. And, 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 uh, so it's a huge security and political risk and I'm uh, wrapping up very quickly. And uh, so, but China is not like, um, uh, not knowing the risk that actually you, you know that they are actively trying to find solutions. One is this uh, multilateral organization building, that uh, the famous one of course is AIIB. That um, I always tell people that the AIIB is a kind of a solution to the problem, rather than the uh, triangle. Triangle is uh, development of Chinese uh, um, investment because uh, all of these loans so far China is lending these developing countries, a bilateral loan, like China to money American country, China to whoever. So if that country default and don't re re refuse to repay the loan, it's only China problem. And nobody's going to help China to go after that country to repay the loan. Uh, if you build the AIIB, that it becomes a multilateral institution. Uh, China usually, the, the structure of the loan is that uh, China contributes a large part, usually 40%, 50%, and other countries contribute others. And usually the structure is that uh, AIIB loan fund the project, and then World Bank and Asia Development Bank fund another part of the project. So uh, you get a lot of so-called stakeholders in one particular project, so when this country or this project uh, responsible person refuses to repay the loan, that is not only China's problem, but uh, also the problem of uh, China friends in the multilateral government. Yeah. It's just like that you lend money to your friend, then your friend is not trustworthy. You ask your mu muscular uh, guy or police or whatever to put together with us to lend it together, so if that guy didn't repay, you is not only your problem, but also your your macho guy can help you go up to the guy who can pay the thing. So it is the it is the idea that, that that if you only try to only lend the money to that, uh, if they don't repay, it's China problem. But with this multilateral institution, it's become a diversification of risk. Um, I don't have time to go over it, but uh, another projection of formal military power is also limited. But the PLA uh, has talking about, and, and there's a lot of talk about. Uh, um, uh, Chinese uh, uh, trying to have uh, overseas military base right now, uh, but it is again it's very exaggerated. Uh, the most uh, significant form of China military projection of military personnel is uh, participation in the peacekeeping mission in, uh, in the form of full helmet in the United Nations uh, peacekeeping force. Uh, so it's not like uh, anything that the U.S. or even Russia has, has, been, has been doing. They really foreign military base and has a kind of a springboard of projection. Uh, so it is a limited option, a uh, lot different development, but this is one most promising thing. There's a lot of things that I'm going to talk about. Is this the contracting model of uh, war making? Is that uh, this this guy, um, uh, Eric Prince? Eric Prince is the former CEO of Backwater. Uh, so he's a retired marine. Uh, when he was in the Backwater, Backwater is doing all the not all the a lot of dirty jobs for the U.S. military in Iraq. Um, and now he is in Hong Kong working for a state-owned company in China. 
Um, and then, uh, by the way, and his sister, you know his sister, who is his sister? Bessie DeVos is the current Ministry of Education in the US government. Uh, so he's a very interesting fellow, and, and, and after Obama became president, he was in trouble and went after by the federal government, and then he escaped, not escaped, that like, left, left the US and left uh, backwater, uh, and uh, ended up in Dubai, and then this uh, Chinese financier, the uh, Fujianese financier based in Hong Kong, uh, Johnson Ho, uh, uh, got him to Hong Kong, as uh, yeah, very cheerfully looking at the map of Africa, so he left Colombia, and, uh, and then, and, and then, um, and he has a memoir talking about his backwater years and published by Sitik, Zhong Xin, that's the same uh, publisher, published the tra Chinese translation of my travel book. Um, and, and so he's very it, it's very interesting. And then you look at uh, the community farm is called a Frontier Service Group. Uh, it is trained in Hong Kong stock market. Uh, you look at the stakeholder, uh, Johnson Go and Eric Prince are there. But Sitik, Sitik is the Chinese uh, state-owned conglomerate. Um, uh, institutional investor and things like that. So it is the, the structures and it's uh, traded in Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Uh, and also you look at this, uh, the board of directors and you have Eric Prince and you have Johnson Go, uh, and you have a number of people who actually have formerly executive of major Chinese state of enterprise. And you look at the financing structures, the principal bankers who lend money to that, uh, the Chinese state banks. Um, so basically it is a kind of a Chinese state uh, company enterprise and uh, uh, so it's repeating the, the backwater story. It's basically the security firms um, uh, doing what? Doing, providing secu security and logistic service to Chinese investment, protecting Chinese investment in first in Africa. Then now they're going into the poor country too. And of course, then, then people, there's a lot of coverage. We can search it uh, recently uh, that uh, talking about that uh, Chinese, this Chinese backwater, military contract uh, protecting Chinese uh, Overseas interest helping China to go colonial is according to one uh, title of uh, of one of the report, and then people ask Eric Pin, what are you doing there? And then Eric Pin is saying that no, we are not doing the dirty military stuff, and none of our employees uh, have guns. Uh, they are they don't have guns, and then but you, you know what they mean, what they are actually doing. You look at the company report, uh, largest part of the of the expense is where is it uh, is. Um, uh, it's a contracting, further subcontracting to 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 think and I look at as a contractor. They are they are like a local transportation company uh, in Africa, uh, uh, here and there. And then you, in those places, you can imagine who are running those uh, local airplane uh, company, local logistics company. There, are, some of them are warlords and, and local militias and things like that. So yes, that their employees. Uh, don't carry guns, but there's a contract that definitely carry guns. It's impossible for them to do the job without carrying guns. And so it is a security firm. So what they offer to the Chinese uh, in, uh, government and the Chinese state company is to transfer his networks of um, of subcontractor in Africa uh, and elsewhere uh, to help uh, China's uh, protect the investment and things like that. Um, so and it's a press release very recently that uh, that the Frontier Service Group. Uh, is adjusting its corporate strategy to better capitalize on opportunities available from China's One Belt One Road Development Initiative, and they are increased, establishing a forward base in Yunnan uh, uh, and also in uh, Wangqi in Xinjiang. Uh, so uh, for training the people and training security people, and, and, and as a forward base uh, to protect Chinese investment in the Central Asia and the Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, at the very end, that, uh, so that uh, the conclusion is that it is an innovative uh, uh, solution that China doesn't need to uh, send PLA overseas to, to protect to solve the security problem uh, uh, of Baron Moore and then using the concept contract there. And then, of course, that you will wonder uh, whether China will actually trust this guy because uh, he is very established figure and, and he is tied with uh, US military and US government and things like that. But, what I suspect is that the China long time ago and actually is already happening. That uh, just like a state-owned enterprise guy getting a kind of a foreign uh, joint venture investment, you get a foreign investor to set up a foreign joint venture investment. The whole <coughs> point is not for the foreign foreign partner to stay in China forever. So it is the origin of all this trade war and things. And then you get you in, make some money, uh, and then the Chinese partner will learn all the skills and learn, learn all the networks that you have, and then start to. 
a lot of version of your stuff that you're making, uh, and then you will be capable in eventually. Uh, so I, I suspect it is what is going to happen in the long run, but uh, before, uh, we, we don't know, we will see, uh, but before we, we uh, actually end that there is a kind of actual reason report about uh, Eric Prince trying to venture, and it is a, a short video in here, and this article is very good, and there are many more articles out because of his connection with uh, Bessie DeVos and all these things, and and, uh, um, and he was brought him actually in the in of, of the, the victory, um, so when the night when Donald Trump won the election, and Donald Trump went on stage with a group of supporters to thank and, and celebrate that I won the presidency, and he was brought that Eric Prince on the stage with Donald Trump. Um, so it's, uh, it's interesting fellow, and now working for China. And then they have this um, school um, in Beijing. That so that is this is the school in Beijing that they have this military and, and, and security training school, and there's a. Beetle. Developing country is very more project lot to pay the loan or investment in US dollar. They try to convince the people to take run B. Uh, China has been so far not very successful in doing it, but right now they are starting to, to be successful. But later still, that China has with Iran um, uh, to build this uh, this uh, facilities for this oil industry in Iran to bypass US sanctions that Iran agreed to take run B. Uh, so it is another story. So it is this kind of a currency thing. Uh, but another big uh, constraint on the Baron Wall is this security and political, geopolitical risk thing that if China can successfully solve this problem, then the Baron Wall can uh, have a lot of room to expand in the long run. But if not, then, then the Baron Wall is, has hit the kind of a bottleneck. And right now, the Chinese uh, solution, a lot of Chinese solutions to this problem, that the one solution that I think is most promising or uh, has a prospect of being successful is this kind of a subcontracting and uh, using private security um, uh, solution. And actually, Russia is already doing it. That's, uh, Russia has a lot of uh, mercenaries uh, being employed to do a lot of jobs in Syria and other places. But uh, this is another story. So let me end here, and then we can go deep in any one of the points that I raised uh, in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so there is a uh, one. Uh, so I really agree with the like the security aspect of it because the one belt and one road. You can see that a lot of those countries it goes into are a very unstable country. Yeah. But there is also a saying that because those countries are traditionally under the Russian sphere, yeah. so there is a challenge that well, like 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 
there's a saying that uh, so yeah. like China and Russia are like close friends. Yeah. But if the Wagan and Wan road extends to the Middle Asia, yes. then yes. Yes. like the probably the Russia will be yeah. first of all. Yeah, be really concerned. So. Yeah. Yeah. Shall we take a round? No, okay, sure. Yeah. Any other questions from students? I just had a, a question uh, about the multilateral organization building and specifically about the AIB. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, if I understood your presentation correctly, you were painting it as a way to distribute risk. Yeah. Uh, and that's, I guess, to do with you know, the situation, say, in uh, Venezuela. Lots of money in, but no money coming back out because of the security situation. But uh, if the AIB um, is mostly, as I understand, lending money to places that the State World Bank is also lending money to, yes. doesn't that mean that they're not distributing the risk because they're not investing in risky countries necessarily? Yeah, the, the first thing for the Russia financial, that you're right, that Russia is a big um, Roman elephant despite all this uh, on the surface talk about Russia, China, friendship and strategy. You see, a lot of signs that actually the Russian is very anxious. For example, I was in the Gaida Forum in Moscow like uh, two or three years ago, and uh, they have this uh, Russian version of uh, more economic forum uh, that happened in Moscow in every January. And who wants to go to Moscow in January? I went <laughs> like sunset in 3 p.m. and sunrise in like 11 a.m. Then and there's no skiing, like the horse and it's just this. But uh, people are there, and I was in a panel about where I uh, sitting by my side is Justin Ning Yi Fu. Um, and he, of course, talked about that this kind of uh, Central Asia has been uh, 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 overlooked by all these big powers, and this very more real, for the first time, has real uh, economic opportunity and things like that. And that is a former president and former central bank banker of, uh, I think it's Kazakhstan and also Turkestan. The, that, that is this situation with the Republic. And also the, uh, the, the Vice Minister of Economic Development in the Russian government. And then you see the dynamics that, that this Russian guy is very irritated. And then in his round to present, he's just reading a statement about they have a central Eurasian aid union. Uh, and then uh, do some big comment about how much Russia has invested in this country and how much, and then, then, then Russia is always there, things like that. So you see the competition between China and Russia over this central uh, uh, Asia republics. And actually, that uh, uh, recently there's already a, a lot of report about that. But uh, actually, I have uh, undergrad students who have a Russian heritage and did a research within all the Russian material for his senior thesis, and he's looking at all these kind of Russian discourse on China and the Chinese uh, investment in the. Uh, Russian Far East, and then you see that uh, despite what the Putin government is saying about it, and all these official or unofficial press in Russia, they are talking about all this nasty thing about China and Chinese investment. Like colonization of uh, Siberia and, and Russian Far East, we are going to lose, lose uh, the Russian Far East forever. So there's a lot of hostility in, in, under the, the big talk about uh, Russian China, uh, uh, Russia China. Uh, 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 cooperation and there's a recent article in the Economist actually citing some of the diplomats in, in DC in saying that uh, US can wait it out, wait a little bit uh, when uh, Putin was less powerful or the next guy came in uh, replacing Putin supposed to happen uh, uh, around 2024 then that person will actually can have a possibility to realign with the US to counteract China because China is closer and Russia is actually more anxious about China um, moving into Russia back up than, than the US is far away. It's just like Mao moving to Nixon and, and, and against Russia. So the same dynamic, this triangle of uh, Russia, China, uh, uh, Russia, China, and, and the US. So it is a very important issue that now Russia, well, Russia is, but right now Russia uh, can do nothing about it because of the sanction. That uh, they have to rely on China for a lot of things. And uh, China is actually repressing the price that Russia is uh, selling the natural gas and all this thing to China, and at the same time, there's a lot of Russia in Hong Kong nowadays, you know, uh, because there's uh, 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 a Hong Kong-Russia agreement about free visa visiting, and also a lot of uh, Russian companies are starting to try to flow the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Uh, so the Hong Kong Stock Market become one of the, the outlet for the Russian company to raise capital, actually, when they are facing the sanction in, in Europe and in the West. So they are dependent on China right now, so they cannot uh, uh, fight that, but uh, they can change easily. 
as we can tell from, uh, from China shifting of the line from Russia to the United States in, in the 60s and 70s. And um, for the AIB, what I mean by the diversifying uh, risk is about diversifying risk of lot, um, people not returning the loan. Meaning that uh, if I uh, lend money to you and you don't return, I have a lot of my friends to, to put the credit money to lend it to you. So when you don't return the money, then I diversify the risk among my friends. Uh, so it is in that sense. But you are right that uh, uh, the AIB is quite conservative in all this lending. I don't have the latest data that I put together here. It is the, um, the data about this project. Um, First, uh, the initial capitalization of 100 billion, uh, let out uh, 4.4 billion in the first two years, um, and it is much um, um, uh, smaller than what they expected, and it's much more than Asian Development Bank. So, uh, so they are very conservative in land, and also uh, <coughs> they are also very conservative in picking who to lend to. That they don't lend to the place as advertised uh, with the original thing that. Well, we need the AIB to serve the underserved area, but in actuality, that they are lending to all these kind of credit is already getting loans from ADB and Morgan and things like that. Because most, I uh, last time I checked, there's a lot of single project that AIB fund that is solely funded by AIB. Usually, AIB just fund at most 50% of it, and then the World Bank or ADB, this traditional organization, fund the rest. Uh, so, uh, so they're very cautious. Uh, it is why that you see all this um, uh, traditional power uh, of, uh, from World Bank and ADB also getting the LIB loan. And the interesting thing to look at is that who, who is getting most of the loan? India. So um, uh, uh, what are the people originally expect all the, the best friend of China will get most of the loan, but actually it is, it is not so uh, much a good friend of China uh, historically that get loan and then and even China got some loan itself. It's like Beijing natural gas project. That it's, uh, um, but um, but uh, it seems that the first, the China is very uh, cautious. Uh, AIB itself is very cautious. And at the same time, uh, China seems to be, as I can tell from this graph, that I can tell that China is not in total, total control about the loan allocation. That, uh, um, um, and, and actually, there's a literature about this uh, China role in what is about collateral. Organization. There's a very good book about uh, w China and WTO, and written by Kristen Hopewell. That uh, she has been teaching in the Vancouver area for a while. Now she is teaching in the University of Edinburgh, and she is Canadian. Uh, and the book is uh, Breaking the WTO, um, talking about Brazil, India, and China in the WTO. And what you find is that China is actually not is quite inept in creating this politics of multilateral um, uh, institution. It has the economic firepower. But it is not good at paying politics in this international organization yet. So uh, India and Brazil economically is less um, uh, has less weight than China, but they are setting an agenda uh, because they are very they are, they are bureaucrats or their representatives sent to this organization very good at paying politics in this international organization. That I think, despite AIB is a China's uh, pet project, I think similar thing uh, would be happening that. Uh, that China that is still learning to how to have exert the full control of this organization. Like US used to control the agenda and the planning priority of England and World Bank and, and uh, uh, IMF and such and such. Okay, we can take questions from everyone else. Alice, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for really fabulous talk. So uh, I'm the chair of the NA World Communication and we have 21 students here in the room. Uh, and on their behalf, I want to ask you about um, the reality of Belt and Road as a uh, program or a policy statement versus the Belt and Road as a marketing yeah. and, um, and promotional initiative. So that's one question. And the other question I wanted to ask you is a clarification about the difference between the export of capital versus yeah. the export of excess capacity yeah. and how those are related. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, so um, since you discussed a little bit the China-Russia relation, yeah. would you like to do the same for the China-India relation? Yeah. <laughs> I have a question about Iran. You know, Iran. Has the Chinese government counted on Iran as a good 
place for investment because it doesn't have uh, the instability of many African countries. It has a government which is in charge and can protect the Chinese investment. Yeah, uh, I let to ask you about uh, uh, you saying the exaggerations of the exports, mm -hmm. and then you also say it is uh, it's uh, because of the methodologies. Mm -hmm. And I read another uh, uh, another kind of book on trade wars mm -hmm. and, uh, in Hong Kong, and talking about uh, basically about the province submit the figures, and the country have another set of figures. So the province act together. So that's uh, act together may not be what the uh, country was. Uh, was presenting, and so my question here is: Is it a deliberate uh, intent? Is it intentional for for, for the export uh, figures being exaggerated? Is it a reason for that, or is it just pure uh, methodologies? And in that case, how big is that uh, exaggeration? Will that affect how we look at the Belt and Road Initiatives? Uh, shall we aim for the green answers? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, marketing. That uh, I, I, I hear this word a lot that, uh, since I, I recently in the last time it started to be involved in some university administrative stuff that the university administrator keep using the word branding. That uh, I'm in the lectures, I care about the works and research, and I never think about branding. But it seems that in, in, in the mind of the administrators, and I'm, I'm sure in the mind of the Chinese government and companies, that branding is very important. So, in some, to a certain extent, the variable is a branding. Um, the, that uh, a lot of this kind of project that's now folded under Baron Road that actually is happening anyway before Xi Jinping before Baron Road concept, but they just because be, before before Xi Jinping and this um, Hu Jintao, Hu Jintao Big Bang is trying to back to Africa, uh, but now all this China back what would they talk about trying to back to Africa nowadays? They all folded under Baron Road. And one is the marketing, one is the political brand that they want to fold everything great. Things, supposedly quick things under Xi Jinping very well. Uh, so forget about what you don't forget about Africa. And Venezuela also that it predate very well, but now in, in, in all these Chinese uh, policy discussion and discourse and talk, they're all talking about uh, Venezuela being part of the very well project and, and, and everywhere everything is related to very well outside China. Even uh, this Chinese investment in like Manchester or the Germany that they have they're building railroad uh, connecting Chengdu and Sichuan all the way to the one one line to Poland, one line to Germany. So this investment in Europe also framed it as very important. And when I'm I mean imagine when this uh, send people to the moon that the moon should be part of the <laughs> So it is branding politically and, and economically and uh, the excess capacity and and capital export, it is, it is, um, capital export is the general term that I use to talk about foreign investment, that uh, foreign direct investment, that uh, excess capacity is, is, is the kind of phenomenon that I see as a kind of a, uh, impetus that drive the capital export. Why capital go out? That didn't have to, uh, to do something to do with my uh, Marxian analytical route that this kind of a theory about over accumulation that why capital needs to go out usually because there's excess capacity that you have more capital then uh, it can be um, uh, profitable uh, so that you find new profit or uh, new, new source of profit overseas and so it is, it is how they are related and um, Iran Iran that uh, the deal with Iran that uh, is um, Actually, to my view, it is uh, more advantageous to China than Iran because, uh, yes, you're right that uh, China investment in all these oil facilities and oil industry in Iran is not like in Africa. In Africa, basically, China move in and control the thing because the local government is weak. But in Iran, the government is strong and they control the thing. But at the same time, uh, the trends long to the Iran that you look at the details of the term is like, like uh, China can delay delivery and delayed payment for up to two years and all the loans are uh, uh, paid in a discounted or loan or investment paid in a discounted way in Roman B or any African currency. It's an interesting fact that uh, China can deliver uh, the investment or loan in some African currency. That is the, the, the African currency comes from the pro proceeds and profit from China investment in these African countries. So that it helped China to solve this problem. China invest in Africa, earning some African currency that they don't want to have. So it's really Iran. And also printing a lot of Roman to Iran. 
So it is very advantageous to China because um, uh, uh, China very does tend to land in the Roman, uh, in US dollar because it cut into its foreign exchange reserve. But now if in Iran, you can use all this money that they earn in Africa that they don't want to give, and also probably that they have limitless capital to to go to Iran. And so the deal is not that advantageous to Iran because uh, Iran, uh, as you know, that need to have uh, access to USD to buy all kinds of things from the international market. It's what the sanction is about, and so the expectation is that Iran will get this money and get this American currency and then go to some European banks to change, uh, exchange it in the US dollar in the end uh, to buy stuff in the international market. And in this process, Iran is going to get a lot of discount uh, several times, uh, and, and at the same time, China uh, will increasingly take control. And then one of the deal is that China will send 5,000 security personnel on the ground to protect the investment in Iran. So it's amazing that Iran will allow it, but of course, when it happens, it uh, the, the, the depends on how it unfolds, but the plan is that they will allow the Chinese to send 5,000 security personnel. Not having specified whether it's PLA or this private company security personnel, we don't know. But it's part of the agreement. So the agreement is working toward the advantage of China more than uh, more than uh, more than Iran. Uh, and um, and then the question about uh, trade war. Uh, about the the, uh, the export figures. About, the export figures. Um, yeah, about um, uh, exaggerations. exaggerations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And how yeah how it come about and, and why is it so? What is the intentional? I think it is uh, uh, it is a lot. Intentional in the sense that they they deliberate it in trade figures, but it's just because how fun things work, and, and usually uh, it's not only about trying to find investment. It's about everything. That um, uh, uh, don't trust the amount that uh, the Chinese company or Chinese uh, government hatch because usually um, that um, amount will change over time, and it will usually change for smaller. And for example. There is a talk about uh, uh, an Arizona solar panel company and working with a Chinese company to build solar farms and uh, solar panel factories also in Inner Mongolia. And there's a huge uh, fanfare and a huge uh, uh, reception and an MOU signing ceremony and then the US media is talking about it for a while, about this, how many billion dollars involved that is going to be the biggest uh, solar uh, panel factories in the world and things like that, and then uh, it's how journalism works as well. So journalists will go after this kind of uh, event, signing of MOU cere uh, ceremony. So they they, they report it. Uh, so when they have the agreement, so it happened in a very loud way, and, and everybody noticed. But when it died, it died silently, and nobody noticed that 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 uh, in the Mongolian uh, solar panel factory never happened because of the don't manage to like, secure enough financing and things like that. Things, things are uh, end of that uh, in way, but nobody report about it unless you have an investigative journalist follow up what is going on. So it is uh, this media and and how these um, uh, dynamics of uh, the Chinese uh, hedging and MOU and, and, and the very Chinese characteristics, concept of the contract and all these kind of things work together to create this discrepancy. And then I find that, uh, and I track with the Deborah uh, the data, I also find that that's quite a consistent discussion of 1 to 10. That if they say 300 million, that uh, give or take, that what actually happened on the ground is uh, 1 tenth. Uh, according to the data we, we look at, uh, uh, it's a little sample because there's not a lot of data points with uh, the transport figures. Uh, so it is, I don't think it is deliberate, but it is the, the mechanism uh, of how it works. Another reason that I already talked about, bit in the presentation is that uh, uh, China, when the Chinese company signed contract, they just uh, imagine that you cut a deal with the central government, everything will be all right, but uh, they don't pay enough attention about the central government, local government uh, dynamics. Uh, the, the, the one example is Pakistan, and a lot of Chinese uh, culture in Pakistan in the area with separatists and with a lot of trouble. Uh, so they they have the investment project. They try to deal with the central government then in Pakistan, and also the civil, civilian and the military uh, uh, the, the division in the Pakistani government. They they uh, um, uh, they sign deal with one party, and then but when it need to be executed on the ground, that the other parties of the local government is not helping. Uh, there's a lot of problem. Uh, there's a lot of kidnapping and actually killing. Chinese national and uh, in, in Pakistan, uh, 
uh, nowadays. So, so it uh, actually lead, uh, add to this kind of uh, the problem of uh, many uh, investment projects that just didn't uh, materialize. I have a lot of interesting story about it, but, but another thing is, uh, let me add one point, is that uh, also the central and local government uh, dynamics in China have, have, have some uh, uh, problem because uh, uh, my student working on Chinese investment in the Philippines, and uh, one interesting thing he find out is that it's casino. A lot of Chinese uh, local companies and provincial companies are trying to deal in, in, in Philippines to build this casino uh, in Philippines. Uh, but then uh, Xi Jinping has a kind of anti-corruption campaign going on. And then Xi Jinping, after the central government know that these guys are doing casino, and all of the customers are Chinese uh, from the province who have a building a casino. So the Xi Jinping get very upset about it, and the central government sent people to the Philippines to tell the Philippine government to shut down that uh, project. Uh, so it is nothing to do with the Filipinos, but uh, it has something to do with the Chinese part. That, that is the Chinese company and Chinese provincial government want to make profit, but in the central government, is not going along with the final uh, selectively usually that, uh, that they go after it and make the project not happen. So it is another massive part. That, uh, uh, so it is why is this discrepancy? If you are a journalist, if you are a black um, uh, researcher, you don't only look at news report, you only look uh, document the uh, MOU, the contract signing, the, the photo, the photo of kind of things. And, and, and after that, there's a lot of things happening that make this project actually uh, so, uh, thank you, Professor. Your book is a textbook in my course of international communication, which is a great contribution for our field of area, but focusing on Belt and Road this semester specifically. Uh, but because it's a school of communication course, we have to bring in communication dimension, and I hope if you could uh, comment on the potential of the digital Silk Road with uh, Huawei, Beidou's uh, satellite navigation system and JTE, yeah. Alibaba, yeah. leading the implementation of telecom in Belt and Road partner countries, yes. Yes. Uh, and especially leading uh, BRICS fiber optics submarine cable uh, yeah. connecting China to uh, part of South Asia and then to Africa and back to Brazil, yeah. and all the way going uh, north to Russia. Yeah. Uh, do you see any potential of alternative internet infrastructure yes. building up a challenging or yeah. encounter to US dominated uh, yeah. internet uh, yeah. system? Yeah. yeah. Um. Uh, some easy spring from UBC, yeah. uh, EU. Uh, the question is, uh, we, we know that there is an increase, there was this radio report about the number of projects that, that were encountering a financial problem, and contrary to what Vice President Pence is saying, uh, 39 out of 40 cases, uh, China actually gave concessions to reschedule the debt, get better interest rates. So in the end, China is paying quite a bit of money, and so it goes through the few banks, the, the, the national banks. So is there, is there a potential risk, you know, as there is less and less credibility, credible enforcement of those conditions? Yes. And this competition, Malaysia defaults, yeah. then Thailand yeah. blocks the construction, they only build one mile of their train yeah. and because they yeah. are seeking for better condition. Isn't, isn't there a risk of unraveling here yeah. where lack of credible community means that the, 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 the banks will be saddled with very, very big bank pretty soon? Yeah. And the related question is there has been recognition of all those project problems, even by Xi Jinping and his speech at the, at the at summit. And he essentially announced a sort of Belt and Road uh, 2.0, where yes. there would be much better risk management, much yeah. better community engagement, better environmental risk management. And so, as far as you know, since that, yes. do you see any uh, creation of better institutional management? The NDRC used to have just three people in a tiny room yeah. for Belt and Road, right? Yeah. Do we see a, a, a building of capacity to sort of rein in the banks and all the private actors yeah. from being so risk takers. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we have just a few minutes left, so I know that there are other questions. Um, I <coughs> urge the discussion to continue at the reception downstairs, but yeah. the last few minutes. Yeah, uh, there are two questions. And, and, and the first one is the communication. That, that is, a, it, it is a very complicated issue because um, from the, the perspective of the customers, if you are a country thinking about, for example, building a 5G network and telecommunication network, and you think about 
uh, whether you have Huawei or you have uh, European or American companies, and the, the Chinese uh, competitive advantage is always cost. It's, the, it's cheaper than other places. Uh, and uh, so it is a big incentive for countries to use it. And now, of course, there's a, another factor is this uh, US uh, kind of uh, unhappiness about if you go for China. But the problem is that the US leverage about what to do, do about it and if they go for China anyway, then, then, then that is an enforcement problem from the US as well. And then if you compare with the Chinese communication networks and, and equipment and the US telecommunication network and equipment, uh, unless you are key allies of the US, like Australia and, 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 uh, uh, and all the 5i country, that the security is a key concern, then otherwise for Germany, for example. That uh, Germany, I know a lot of Germans is very upset about the re revolution by Edward Snowden, that actually that the US uh, is using, government is using its communication to monitor the, the, the conversation of uh, Merkel. <laughs> So they, they think that, that if there's a security risk with Chinese telecommunications, then the same security risk or similar security risk or even larger security risk is from the US as well. And uh, then they, the, this security argument is not very uh, compelling from, from this country's kind of perspective uh, against using the China networks. And, uh, and of course now the US is trying to make another uh, argument about this kind of this law reliable and maybe break down and things like that. But good time can help. So it's very complicated. And, now down to uh, the problem of, uh, for example, in Europe. Uh, the, the Europe, there's a split about uh, whether they use Huawei or not. And then, but you can, whether they tell them occasion nine of whether countries go for Huawei or whether they don't, is whether they have a stake in uh, the 5G development. For example, a lot of Europeans, like, like Norway and Finland, they have their own 5G uh, equipment manufacturer, so they have an interest to exclude uh, uh, Huawei such as uh, also the South Korea as well because they have Samsung and things like that. But for a country that don't have a vested interest in this uh, 5G network producing, uh, like Germany or the UK, so they go for cost. Mm -hmm. uh, whoever cheaper, then, then they go for it. And of course, then the security issues is is complicated thing with, uh, it, it kind of uh, 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 make it not only an economic uh, evaluation, but also you think about this uh, diplomatic and security issues. Um, the question about whether this is a great unrivaling of the whole thing, that is actually that is why the, uh, what China's government is worrying about, why it created AIB and trying to boost up governance and things like that, and, and they, they try to, whether they can do it is another thing, and they take time to, but the unrivaling is really, really real, because uh, people uh, talk about this, oh, the Chinese loan has a condition that if you don't, uh, uh, if you don't uh, repay, China will take control, of your port facility, strategic facility, and then there's a still uh, enforcement uh, issues. That uh, one example is Madagascar, that they have political issues, political crisis, and on the basis of uh, uh, default in Sri Lanka is the same. And then uh, uh, in the loan they're trying to make to, to Madagascar, that there's a term about this uh, uh, default, and then uh, China can take control of some strategic facilities. And actually, when 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 Madagascar is in crisis, and actually China's uh, uh, trying to send um, kind of a levy all the way that trying to help evacuate the Chinese president over there, but they turned back uh, in the middle because uh, India low about and then they uh, very upset about the Chinese levy passing the Indian Ocean, so they start to have military exercise in the Indian Ocean. So when China, if China insists on going through that route, then to to win Madagascar, there will be a kind of a confrontation maybe with uh, the Indian Navy and then the, the Chinese Navy is not confident enough they uh, uh, desire to turn back. So what is on the on the contract is one thing, whether China can enforce it is another thing. And so it is this security thing that is the uh, thing that China is working very hard to make sure that it, uh, China can project somehow this political and security uh, capability to uh, as a kind of a bottom line of the, to prevent the unraveling of all this law. Uh, uh, and of course, there's a risk, uh, but uh, if this is enforceable, I mean the, the security political uh, problem is solved, and then China can really enforce the contract. If you default the loan, yes, then it will become and uh, seize your strategic asset. If it is the case, and if China managed to find a way to enforce this, then even it's a financial risk, even uh, the banks involved will get a big loss, and it will be still a win for China for geopolitical perspective. And actually, some conspiracy theories think that that is the Mike Pence and, 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 and 
U.S. has been trying to articulate is that actually China did really lend money to you uh, to make sure that you cannot repay so that they can take control of the strategic asset. But again, that the, the key thing is that you claim the strategic asset to really sending, like the U.S., they have this kind of a paratrooper airborne field division. What is the name of it? Station in North Carolina. They have the capability to, to airdrop anybody. Yeah, something like that. So they to, to have this capability, uh, so that, that, that they claim the facility they can actually seize control, but China didn't have that capability yet. Uh, so before that, then, that, that is really a risk that, uh, that the framework will Thank you. All right, so thank you again, Professor Wong, for your presentation. Uh, we'll see you again in the next session.